So post ride, we've done the mighty rock of Corba now and uh, I'll be honest, it lulled me into a false sense of security and then it kicked me hard. So we didn't have that much of a chance to really unlock life after pro racing with, uh, with David Miller. From my side, I've, I've read the books, thought they were fascinating and my personal intrigue with how the, the body and the mind work together has just been at the heart of what a lot of the stuff I've done in the past and I always like to try and have a chat with people about what makes them tick and um, yeah that mental perspective on, on going from, from pro racer to where you are now is kind of I think it's an interesting topic to, to delve into. Yeah I mean it's not something you don't I mean you don't prepare yourself for it because you you race your whole life and it's it's one of the reasons now that with Richard um, this is Richard Pierce, uh, my partner in chapter three. Um, we came up with this idea kind of of creating that continuation, not necessarily in the racing world, but keeping that kind of drive, keeping all the, co the connections, the, the, all the assets you've built up over those, well, for me, it was 18 years of professional racing and moving into something else rather than just going into a team and being a, a consultant or a direct sportif going and doing something different with it and our first relationship has been with Castelli and and but we want to move into different things and you're right it's like you end up with that same sort of focus objective driven kind of blue sky thinking in many ways this is blue sky thinking what we're doing with this and it's but it, it's nice because I'm completely naive <laughs> I have no idea what's possible and what's not possible but I want to take everything I've done and I want to think that I'm 39 now but maybe when I'm 50 we'll have something that's quite Cool. I mean, you've started on the right track, obviously, building up the connections is the first part. But um, what was that, that moment when you're obviously you're still a pro, ra pro racer and that moment where almost like a realisation moment that there's got to be something more than racing? Because for so many years, I can imagine it was just wake up in the morning. This is what my job is. Get on with it. And then, you know, how did that realisation come to life? Uh, uh, when it started to be feel like work. Uh, I think that was the moment. It never felt like work for me. It kind of, when I was in my younger years, yeah, because we're conditioned to think you're making sacrifices, you don't get to party with your friends, you don't meet girls, you're kind of, you're, you kind of, you have to go to bed early, you have to eat the right diet, and, and everyone says, oh, I don't want to do that, you've got 10 years, but you're thinking, oh. but I got out of that afterwards and, and kind of realised that I just love bike racing. And kind of, I, that was a, quite a small phase of my life, the kind of thinking that I was making sacrifices and being bitter about it. The majority of my career, career has been just loving it, loving, loving bike racing. And then towards the end of it, I stopped loving it as much and it started to feel like I was making sacrifices. And were, that was when I realized I had to stop. Were you ever at a point where you were worried about what was gonna come next uh, after cycling? Well, yeah, massively. God, yeah, yeah, huge. Because it's like, what do we do? We, we disappear. We die slowly. Because <laughs> that's the, you know, for a lot of the time, I see a lot of bike riders, pro racers, you know, from all walks of life, and pro racing is your life. And you're like, everything's done for you. It's like, it's very much a contained world. That's probably actually a good question to ask Richard, because that's something that he saw. He's seen a transition firsthand and kind of watching me kind of go through that transition. And very few people have seen kind of watch me go from that racer to this person who's off. And it's like, so... I know Richard probably has a better kind yeah. of. We started to have some conversations in sort of early part of Davies last year. Um, we were doing the physique shoe project together, all the custom shoes, and, and throughout that process, we were just sort of, you know, we, we were friends before, we were members of, you know, the, the, Bella, the Bella Club Rock of Corba. And it was throughout that process we started to talk about what David would do afterwards. And I used to say to you, you know, you know what are you going to do? And you didn't want to be a DS, you didn't want to be in that environment. And David was always very interested in, in this quite wide field of, but quite creative field of fashion and architecture and design and these things. So we sort of, one night we had a, a couple of beers and um, maybe, maybe a few more and we, and we sort of came up with this idea of, of launching a fashion company. And it was during Flanders and, uh, in 2014. And I didn't really think very much of it, really. You know, we, we sort of went to bed the day after, and then a few days later, David called me and said, you know, Richard, you know, I've been thinking about that. You know, why don't we do it? You know, this, this could be great. So that's sort of where chapter three was born in a way, sort of throughout that process, because I could recognize that David sort of wanted to leap far beyond professional cycling. And, and there's this whole world that's out there that 
he was that you were aware of but weren't part of it and sort of wanted to make that leap into it part of the reason for the club in a way you know the, the fellow club of Corp was made up of some professional cyclists some ex ex pros and a number of this guys that are you know that are the top of their field in in photography or rock music or or design and architecture and and it's, it's a very inspirational group really and I think you sort of and that's it I think because we get very wrapped up in our and in our being a professional athlete you get very wrapped up in that you're you're number one and it's like and you get fettered for so many years and you get allowed to be a bit of a dickhead and be very selfish and self-obsessed and narcissistic etc probably still are but but <laughs> let's not talk about that but this the thing is there's a massive world out there and we meet so many people and that's the the whole thing with Velo Club Rock Corba. It was with Bradley Wiggins originally. We were sitting on a train in two thousand and nine on the way to the final stage when he just got fourth in the Tour de France. And we were like, everybody's into professional cycling. It's like we never meet them. We never meet these people. Because we're so always doing our thing and it's and we don't socialise and we don't hang out. And I say, why don't we create a club where we meet the people that we would love to meet that the only common denominator is we ride bikes and love it and so Velo Club Rock Corba we're not it's just it's an old-fashioned club where it's like we're just a bunch of guys that a common denominator is cycling but we're actually all driven and want to have fun with it and really enjoy it but at the same time successful in their own right so you can draw a bunch of extra inspiration from things and you know like you said if you're in this little cocoon of your own world you just see things and say well we want a club we want to branch out we want to meet these people yeah. how do you actually do that how do you do that you bring in you know you've got your inspiration that's it there. but that's what i mean it's like how do you do that so what do you do you create a club it's like the old it's like field of dreams it's kind of if you build it they will come and it's like I wanted and my friends, when I spoke to my friends who I created, I was like, let's do something that's different. Let's not just go and go do a tour. Let's not go and do some boring stuff. Let's get a group of random people, people we've never met before. So the origins of VCRC is none of the people who are in it knew each other before. It was like, I literally cold call people and like send them emails, long emails explaining what I wanted to do. And I'd never met any of them before and they didn't know each other. So it really was just like, then it became a network they say, oh, I think this person might be kind of right for it. And a lot of the people had never been in a club before because they weren't the, that type of person. And then you get them together and it's just, it's nuts. But it was lovely because I, people think when you're at the level I was at, you know everybody, you know nobody, you never meet anybody. You don't, so you say, you, you, yeah, you, you, you literally just bounce off people. You meet them and it's in uncomfortable situations. And I thought I'd like to create a club where I get it's no longer a bounce or a graze. It's like, get to meet those people. And occasionally you meet someone who's really interesting, you actually get to spend some time with them. And so that's kind of, I'd like to think one of the legacies of all the success I've had is that we can bring all these people together and we can just really learn off each other and have fun as well, have fun riding our bikes. How many, uh, how many members have you got in the club and where do they all come from? You know, it's all walks of life and industries and expertise and... I think we're I think we're around about forty five members. Yeah. There's uh, and across the globe, you know, from we have some guys in in San Fran, in New York, uh, Sydney. Um, there's there's a, a kind of a core. There's two cores really. One in London, where there's maybe about eight of us in London that meet regularly and ride at least once a week together. And then there's the Catalan guys that, that you saw today that you met today. Who are um, they're also, lively, they're lively, lively bunch, bunch yeah. yeah, super cool, yeah. and uh, and it's just become a really, really fantastic network of guys, you know. And we meet up once a year, at least once a year, and we climb the Rock of Corba, or we race up the Rock of Corba in a mass start time trial. And it's the only a lot of professionals day, who are yeah. going to be nervous of times being broken on that day. No, no, not, no, not no. <laughs> no, we we have a rule with Rock of Corba amongst each other. It's like which is probably quite good for people to know. So if you've watched the Cold Collective, you will you will see the records that we have for Rojo Corva. And they're quite recent. This isn't a kind of a new thing. And the lovely thing about this is you have Col de Madon, you have Monte Serra. They're the only two other big mountains that are pro mountains, testing mountains. The records that exist for Rojo Corva, I'm looking this way because I can see it, is they're clean riders that have done this. There's, there's never from the, these records, they're, they're clean. It's Ryder Hedgesdale, Dan Martin, Bradley Wiggins, three guys I know that have done this. And it's, and you've got they're all what sub 29 which is just even 
I find it difficult to believe that you can go that fast up there. But I've been, I was with Ryder the day he did the definitive record and it was just, just disappeared from the start line. It's just, you can't comprehend how fast these guys go. And that's me saying that. But we have a, a rule amongst fellow club rock of Corva. A goal for each of us is it's your age plus 10 minutes because that's a pretty reasonable and a realistic objective to have. So I'm 39, I got a 49, I got to do it in 49 minutes, that's respectable. And honestly, that's a respectable goal to have. And it works, there's very few climbs in the world where you can have something that works like that. And we have that and we keep, that. that's, that's the only objective we have in the club. You've got to like, train to be able to manage that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, After that's that, it. it it's actually, Mike, it's, it's the only day of the year that yeah. the club uh, a, a serious cycling club, to, to be honest, you know. It, we saw it, that it, today. Yeah. Oh no, it's later in the year, yeah, <laughs> exactly. okay, yeah. So, you know, we have our AGM at the end of the year and the guys actually train hard, like Mickey Harper, um, who's our current president of the club, you know, he's the only member, the, the non-professional member of, of the VCRC to go sub 40. He did a 39, 50, A I long think. 39. A long 39, <laughs> yeah. exactly. But that's going some. Yeah, it's good. That's you know, a good time, a, you know. A, We're pretty happy with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and for me, that that's a goal, is to is to go sub 40. Um, I'm not quite there yet. But that's the point of everything we're doing at the moment regards this. And it started with Velo Club Rock Corber and now with Chapter 3 is we're riding bikes, not just you, you notice when we're riding up off camera that I don't have a Garmin, a, a device on my, my bike anymore. And it's simply because I don't like quantifying things anymore. It's like, it's just nice going out for a bike ride. And the thing with Rock of Corver is you go up it to come back down it. It's not a waypoint. It's a, it's yeah. a goal. You're not going anywhere. No. You're going. So you'd like, and it's, it's rare to have a, a mountain where the only reason you go up it is to come back down it. Yeah. And what I found was, you know, that, 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 initial section you're starting to think yeah i'm going to get a rhythm here and yeah average speed's pretty good you know you're still i've got a garmin on the bike still but and i'm thinking yeah this is all right and then you've got that 6k plateau and slight downhill yep catch your breath yeah. and then after that you just see the average speed just plummet straight back down and then you just then my brain's saying that's a really nice view off to the pyrenees there there's some snow-capped mountains and it's just like just enjoy it because yeah, yeah. it's gonna hurt so just enjoy it and like just hang on to the top and i think we saw the essence of the guys today as well the greeting which we got at the top as well that was a greeting like we've been up many mountains and we've seen lots of cows up there and that but we didn't have the proper full-on meeting and that i think that's the essence of the club that was for me what sure it's us you know for cover and yeah. and a really good ham on you know that's that's what we have at every time and we offer it to everybody that comes we up saw and, yeah. you know we saw everyone who came up to the top of the climb bam here's yeah. the glass here's the you know here's your nibbles and you know yeah. sort yourself out have a photo i see i love the idea of strava and all these things i think it's fantastic um but at the same time it becomes very uh isolated it becomes just a device it becomes computer screens and numbers it's nice to find, or I'm a big fan of bike shops and cycling clubs, because I think that's, that's one of the reasons I love it. It's, it's being, being with people, sharing, sharing the experience. Yeah. I, I could ride to the top of Rock and Corp any day I'd like. I don't, obviously, but <laughs> if I do it with my friends and we get to the top and we share it, that's an achievement. Then meeting for lunch and then say, oh, we went to Rock and Corp yesterday. That's cool. I don't, I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm in these two worlds because I love tech. I'm super tech, but also love cycling for me should be about sharing the experience. Mm. I'm really just, I'm massively into that. I think mm. it's so enhancing. Exactly, and the Rock of Cobra, Rock of Cobra is a hard climb, no matter what, which way you look at it, you can say uh, it's only despite, 10K, you know, yeah, you look at it yeah. 7%, whatever, it's not, it's a hard climb, you know, and there's, there's only one way to ride it really fast, which is to attack the, those two downhill sections really hard. From there, you can make you can save 40 seconds on each one of those and then you can shave two minutes off your climb. I always remember Boardman was always, when you're time trialling, you know, it's, it's after the top of the climb or whatever. It's like ride the climb tempo, after it, nail it, because that's where you can really make up some time when everyone else is in the red. Uh, and that kind of always stuck with me. It's like whatever you're doing, whether it's time trialling, climbing, it's kind of a nice discipline. It's, nice, it's a nice point to remember. Um, where do you guys see then, Obviously, the club where it is now, where would you like to see it in the future? What's your, what's your sort of grand ambitions, really? No, no, I've always been completely one. Of, we never go, we're never commercial. Uh -huh. It's like, just I've kind of always been very strong on that. It's, it's so easy to, because it's, it's happened in the last few years where people, oh, we could make this something that, but it's, 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 it's our, it's our, it's our club. Yeah. It's our club. We've never There's your up. mountain. And it's, and it's like, I'm chapter <laughs> yeah. three and I'm, I'm, Castelli's my heritage and, and, and 
and now chapter three, what we're doing, even I've got a prototype jacket on and got these things on. But our clubs, Rafa, do that because that's my old friend, Simon Mottram, and I love Rafa, and they do that, and I won't change, I refuse to change that, even if it's this, because we've done that for seven years. So I stand by that, those values. I don't, but at the same time, we never sell out. We're just, I never, we will never be a sponsored club, yeah. and we will never ask people to kind of pay and become, get a number. I think quite a lot of the guys like the anonymity of the club, you know, that they can... Which we're blowing right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's out the window. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there, there is this anonymity that, you know, some guys can come and ride within that camaraderie and, and not, and it's not all over Instagram and, and social media. It's just got a little bit of exclusivity to it and there's no right or wrong. It's just, it depends what direction you're going in. And it's, at the end of the day, you know, why follow? We can be idiots. Follow. With our club, we can be idiots. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 12 bottles. Yeah. 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 We didn't set any records today. It was a shame, but hey, we had a lot of fun. And uh, in terms of the, the whole inspiration, we touched on it earlier on a little bit on, on the kit. You know, the club, the kit, it kind of all goes hand in hand. I thought it might have been called something Rock of Core, but that you've, you've purposely, you know. It was Richard. Richard came up with the, um, the name Chapter 3. He can explain it to you. Briefly, yeah, I mean, when when David and I were talking about this, about you know launching this sort of fashion brand, really, yeah, as opposed to a cycling brand, and very early on we said, you know, it, we don't want it to be Miller because it partly because of David's history, but almost more because you know Boardman, Mark, you know, Cavendish, uh, Chris Hoy, Ricky Pendleton, you know, that it, it sort of puts you in a bracket straight away. So. I started to think of David's career more as a narrative, really, and looking at how you know his career had been. It was very much like a, a classic three acts to a play, where you have the rising action and then this kind of moment with this destruction and then the fall and then the resurrection. And I and I thought, well, actually, it's quite sort of closed as three acts. They're almost more. It's almost more like a narrative of a book, really. They're almost like chapters of a book. And I suddenly went, hang on chapters you know that chapter one was the rise up until the ban and then chapter two chapter two was the comeback and now chapter three is what we're doing now you know it seems to work much much more than an axe really so that was where it came i just said to david one day i was like you know i've got this idea of chapter chapter three this is our third chapter and david loved it fran his sister loved it and we just sort of we just sort of went from there really so you're you're actually although you're just you're just only just starting chapter three, yeah. you know essentially, you know it could be chapter three is the final part of your career, but you're at the beginning of mm. potentially what's going to be the longest act part. Act one of, of your, chapter three. Exactly, act yeah. one of could be ten acts. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. where are we going? Exactly. So yeah. so you know it gave it gives us a platform where we can go into many different things. We started with cycle clothing because of David's history with Castelli and his loyalty to Steve Smith. You know went from your yeah. uh, your comeback with Sonia Deval and your relationship with Steve goes way back then, you know, like eight, nine years now. So we've, we've sort of worked with Steve to develop this you know, fantastic product and it, it really is sort of, you know, we've, we've worked really hard on, for example, our rocker jacket. We did nine iterations of that. Most people did two or three when they're designing a, a new jacket. We did nine, you know, we wanted to make sure before we launched we got the product exactly right. And it's just a beautiful platform now for us to actually go into these other areas of chapter three. So it, it, it would still very much, as you said, Mike, we're on the starting path of the journey, really. We haven't, we haven't even started yet, to be honest. I think from my side, you know, an outsider, what really strikes me is, you know, the authenticity, the story of authenticity. You know, David's not hiding from anything. And he's always been very open. And that's what, you know, good or bad, rich or poor, it's like you've been open, honest, and it's like and the authenticity which goes with that forward, you know, forward track into chapter three mm -hmm. is what makes a brand. You know, I've worked with a lot of companies over the years, which has been amazing. And you stick by the guys who help you along the way and have faith in you. And, and that's I think for anyone who's looking at what you're doing now, mm -hmm. you've got the credibility. You know, you're not just making something with a well, fashion label or whatever, and it's just, it, it's your life. It's and it's all part of this, it's one of the reasons that I wanted Velo Club Rock Corbra to be there at the top today, because we could easily per be perceived with our Madav Kanda photography, which is incredible, and all our, which could be some pr such pretension, our kind of aspirations of being really cool in a fashion brand. But we're actually just having a, 
a yeah. laugh. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, and I want people to remember, yeah, we're doing that. But it's like, that's only because we see this cycling world as it is, and everyone's taking themselves so seriously. Yeah, and so we're going to go in and we're going to be completely serious on a different level, which we love. It's all creative and arty and, and really kind of where Rich's background, architectural and these sort of things. But the bottom line is, we are a product company. We haven't created a brand to sell product. We're a company that creates products and have built a brand to sell our products. That's what we do. I think that's a really interesting point here, Mike, that when David and I were talking, it was probably a year and a half ago now, when we were talking about the clothing and the potential of it and where we would position it, and there's something you said to me was that you know, you're know you used to the, the, the very latest technical kit, you know, the very highest tech, but we no longer need marginal gains. You know, so there's a lot of compromise that comes with the very best tech, you know, the aero jerseys, they're, they're quite fragile in a way. Um, skin suits, who, you know, we're not racing, we don't need skin suits, we don't need San Remo skin suits. So, but what we've done with chapter three, and is the thing that I'm sort of proudest of, of what we've achieved thus far, is that we've managed to use these very high te technical fabrics and still sort of brought it together in a much more tailored way for, for our, 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 the people that like what we do, you know, our customers. And, and that's, I think, our biggest achievement so far. It's not the brand, it's not this, it's that how you marry those two elements together so that you've, you've got the best kit, but you're, you don't need these marginal gains. I think it's really interesting because the whole, the whole of cycling, I mean, it's obviously exploding. Mm. It's, uh, it's growing massively and, and the potential just for, for new, new enterprises really, it's just taking something and going, hang on a minute, the way I see it is it's essentially what you need. Yeah. You know, you're designing yeah. kit for you, for yeah, your yeah, next part of your life. Point. You know, you're not saying, well, who's Joe Bloggs down the street? what can I do for him? You're saying, well, what do you need yeah. in your next part of your career life? So we said, do you, do you have mitts in your collection? I was like, no, because I only wear mitts for racing. Yeah. And so that's not in our collection. So we won't do those unless right. one day we make race, and, and so we, if one day we make racing kit, then we'll make mitts. But up to now, all chapter three kit is made for my life. Like how kit I ride a bike. Your wardrobe. Yeah. So it's it's yeah. essentially what we said about 18 yeah. months ago. Let's design this first collection as a kit for David as a retired pro. And that's that. Hence the that buttons and yeah. all the kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah, so it was just yeah. do something that's like, I want to. I want to get on a bike for the first time. Stop in a cafe, wear my cycling clothing, and go and uh, not feel like everyone's looking at me like, why have you got words all over you in bright colours? Yeah. And yet get on the bike and feel like a pro, because that's what, for me. I can't do anything like my bike position is still a pro position. All the clothing I wear it has to be. The, the latest, even if it's since I retired, stuff's changing. I need the latest because it's just I'm so accustomed to that. I mean, I'm a, a bike geek, a tech geek. It's like you know, I'll openly admit it, and it's just it's it's refreshing to see some some differentiation, mm. you know, some some design, some design brought into the kit as well, some real just thought, just a little bit outside the box as yeah. well. Um, you know, there's the race side of stuff, and then there's the for the most part, there's everyone else. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's the everyone else, it's isn't it? It's our colour our color palette, really, but we've been talking about it and these sort of military greens and blues and greys and so on. And then I was at uh, Freeze Masters in London, the, the big art show, uh, two years ago, and I saw this Ben Nicholson painting, and it was just exactly the colour palette that, that we've been talking about. So I took a picture of it, sent it to David, I was like, this is, you know, this is these are the colours we're talking about, and there's just combined with this this odd flash of uh what you call like a reveal the like we have a, a like a we call it rosso rosso fuoco you like, like, rosso like, fuoco. like fire red yeah, yeah, yeah. a little bit of fire red on it and you know it's just it's working very well that palette where it's quite yeah but i agree it's like what we have at the moment is and i didn't i wasn't aware of this because when you're professionally racing you have you have no idea what's going on outside you're yeah. kind of you're you're really focused on the on the companies that sponsor and your sponsors, and you don't think about what people are buying. And now I see, and, and I kind of I go on Instagram and see these things, and I go to shops and I see people, and they're all, in the, they're all gone off the, the, the blacks, or they have certain, you've got cleats going on everywhere now. There's not, nothing's become kind of, there's no real look anymore. You've got everyone's either zeitgeist, which is patterns everywhere yeah, and yeah. fucking crazy. Like the, the, I call it the Australian look. Australian look, yeah. which is all like mad, kind Everywhere, of like map yeah. and kind of all these things, and but they're just like a graphic design, take a thing and just sublimate it on on the panels, 
rather than connecting the whole look together. And we're very much more connected than the whole look together. Because we're, we're, we're that kind of, I like, I'd like to think we, we bridge the gap. Where do you, uh, where do you guys, obviously you've, you've, you've come so far, you're at the beginning really, Act 1, Chapter 3, as we've established. Where would you like to see the future? Or where, or where, how are you going to create the future? I'd like to think that five years from now, Chapter 3 is doing things, has track suits, has it becomes like a very much a, a brand that's associated with performance, with tech, incredible high quality and just no pretension, which sounds quite, may sound quite surprising. But that's why I'd like us to do tracksuits next. I think that would kind of be, well, what? You're being also doing this thing and you want to make tracksuits. I want to make, we want to make beautiful tracksuits, people. What about yeah. outside of clothing? You got any ideas? Any but I think we can do anything because Richard comes from a design with Tom Dixon and there's an architect background and I really do think that we could take, we could end up having the things that we love, which is cycling. That's our core. That's where we learn everything for, yeah. from. Because there's no other industry in the world that makes clothes to the, the level of tech that cycling does currently. Honestly, there's only, the only thing that is close to it is bespoke suit making. It's three dimensional, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's unbelievable the kind of the, the materials used and the cuts required. No other sport in the world has the actual requirements that cycling does, making a bespoke mm. does, <laughs> oddly. But then from that, we'd like to move it on to kind of taking that level of, of design and, and architecture to anything. And like almost having a studio, like a design studio, we can do, we could design a chair. Exactly, we could do a chair. Yeah. We yeah. might even design a restaurant, we might even yeah. design a hotel. You know, they're, Heard it they're, here they're, first. They're, they're Exclusive. They're yeah. It's sort of, you know, we started with cycle yeah. clothing because yeah. pretty yeah. much because it's a natural transition and your relationship with Steve that we we move into cycle clothing, but the ambition is... is Plus much, the much, contacts much which you'll make through the club. Yeah. Absolutely. Open That's doors. Exactly how it is. You know. I just think it's blue sky thinking and the fact that it's like, it come from a cutting edge environment, why can we learn so much and we meet so many interesting people and Richard comes to design a car, it's like, yeah. has, is an architect, loves cycling, understands the design, the design, the principles are pretty same, you move up through the ranks, then you, but as long as you've got the vision, we could perhaps just have fun with it. Then you've got, aside from that, you've got like the tangible product. You know, you've said restaurants or, you know, clothing, bikes, whatever. And then you've actually got the physical side. So you could, there's, there's areas where you could offer services which you've learned about, which is the physical body, yeah. you know, and it's like actually well, educating. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, that's one thing I'm doing at the moment. It's like I'm developing a time trial course, a training course. And that's something that I'm really passionate about because it's one of the reasons I wrote The Racer, because I'll forget stuff. And so to be able to like now create a kind of a time trial system for people to kind of follow and buy into and your performance will just increase massively and it will be fun and it's just like it's easy everyone gets so wrapped up and have to spend 500 pounds on a wind tunnel or, or do this and that it's like well, no it's actually a lot easier than that and i still have it all here and so kind of that's one of the things i'm really kind of pushing for at the moment is do this while i still have it do because five years from now no one's going to give a shit I've had a David Miller time trial <laughs> course. Yeah. So, but now I can still do it. So that's one of the things that I'm kind of, I'm really passionate about at the moment. And that performance side translates to everything. I mean, we had a very brief chat between labored breath on the climb about time trialing is very much the same as climbing. It's about gauging your effort. It's about, you know, monitoring where you're at, your exhaustion, your maximum, and, and trying to get the balance right. So it's, I think it can yeah. relate to anyone. Yeah, it's pacing. I mean, it's all pacing. It's one and of the things gearing. You and pacing. Get your that's compact gearing on, yeah. that's it. <laughs> I'm a big fan. Got a lot of respect for your 34. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, yeah. I would, no, wouldn't be without it. 39, 25. <laughs> and you look so elegant. <laughs> yeah. Not. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, from, from my side, as I say, it's kind of nice just to sort of sit down, chill out, ride the climb, obviously see it firsthand, but I, I, was, I was keen just to delve into the, the mind after cycling and see where it was all going and I think we've certainly experienced that today and uh, yeah, it was good just to have you guys along for the ride. Oh, I think it's Can't a pleasure. I appreciate it nice. enough. It was awesome. <laughs> no, no, no. It's good to be much. part of the Core Collective. It's, I'm glad we were the people that did Rock Accord by Core Collective. It because, couldn't have been anyone yeah, else, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, yeah. It was because yeah, yeah. I would have been saying, hey, Dave, yeah. I'm going yeah. up Rock Accord. <laughs> like, I need some facts. You'd be like, well, what are you doing that on your own for? Sort yeah. it out. No, no. Get some carver at the top. So I uh, really appreciate it. Taking yeah, the time out. Enjoyed the the VCRC welcome at the time. We've had, as I say, we haven't had a welcome like that. And to be honest, 
I don't think we're going to have another welcome like that. So I think you, do, you guys have done us proud. Well, thank you for having us. Cheers. Thanks, Mike. Thank you.